Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Your Excellency Mr. Yakesh, Your Excellency Ambassador uh, Duet, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome the final day uh, of the Ankara Conference on Peace Building and Conflict Resolution, uh, where in particular we're exploring the potential cultural diplomacy has in the field of peacekeeping. Uh, it's been an excellent two days. I myself, I know, have learned a lot, uh, benefited a lot. I think I'm still moving through my mind the many thoughts and the many, uh, let's say, inspirations uh, of the previous days. And I think there the goal that ICD has with a conference like this is not necessarily to give you one message or the other message, uh, just to get you thinking a little bit differently uh, about this issue or that issue uh, by keeping it interdisciplinary, uh, also international. So we're going to continue that tradition today. Uh, very happy to introduce our first speaker of the day, someone I've had the chance to get to know also over the, the previous few days, uh, which has increased also my interest uh, in hearing the presentation itself, uh, which I think very well fits into the, the topic of the, the conference. Uh, so allow me to say a few words uh, about Sibyl uh, Atasai. Uh, she studied initially in Heidelberg in Princeton University. She holds a degree in political psychology with social psychology background. She also has held several positions uh, on youth social integration policy throughout the early years. Today she works for the United Nations Development Program's Democratic Governance Un Unit. There she is a political psychologist and cons uh, consults the national dialogue process in Lebanon and the Common Space Initiative for Shared Knowledge. The topic that she'll be speaking on today is how political psychology contributes to peace building and conflict resolution. I'd ask you to please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ms. Sibyl Atasayi. Thank you. Okay, so um, good morning to all. It's nice to um, actually the smaller the group, the better. Uh, so it shows that the socialization took place beyond the conference, which is also one aim of that. So very nice, and thank you very much for coming. Um, actually, I'm. I'm. I, one thing I've learned back from the U.S. is that I don't like uh, traditional lectures. I like to have it more in a more American way of school. So um, it's going to be a little bit more participative, and I. I warmly welcome you to a journey and to something more at the periphery of peace building and conflict resolution, which is more a, in a like more a innovative approach to look at the things from another perspective. So um, many of you were asking me what is political psychology about. So I like to um, get I like to um, um, accompany me um, on the journey to from the theory and ending up in the practical field. What, how political psychology has been applied. Um, but first, let us start um, what is political psychology about with the theory. No worries, not, many that, not, not that many slides. So political psychology actually is dedicated to understand the bi-directional um, relationship between political, between... Okay, I think I'm not going to use a microphone, is that fine? It has to? Okay. Um, okay, it's first it's um, okay. Well, neither way. Um, okay, so first, um, political psychology all takes place between this triangle: political science, politicians, and political behavior. So these are the three units of analysis we are dealing with. Political science traditionally is something that actually goes for is traditionally known as looking at the voting behavior of people looking at, um, uh, at uh, membership, looking at how people um, do come together within groups and um, looking at how active they are. So it's, um, it's one field I think all of us um, today here are to different degrees are involved in. Um, politicians is one part where the psychology is coming into the place, which means um, it comes to politicians in terms of what about their leadership styles like, like Erdogan, which is, has which been he has been perceived in personality psychology as somebody, okay, this is not one second, this is a little bit, exactly, so. Um, so politicians are being uh, one unit of analysis by looking at what about their leadership styles? Is it that more right-wing people are voting for AKP or is it more left-wing people? What values, what beliefs, what motivations they have? Motivations are being defined as a goal-driven behavior. 
So this is one part we are looking at, and um, also to in what to what extent gender plays a role in that, how we perceive a leader, and then it's coming into Babajan leadership, a paternalistic leadership, or is it more a charismatic one? So this is our old stuff we use, and if you're talking about politicians, we also um, the Obama campaign was monitored by a committee of social psychologists looking at how is a person who is who is traditionally a member of a of an out group, which means a minority group, how is he being perceived in terms of his competence, in terms of his capabilities? So this is all stuff um, being subsummarized under the psychology of change. Um, political behavior as itself has many dimensions. There it's coming into intergroup violence, intergroup dynamics, which means how people define their in-group towards the out group. So what is making actually, what are the driven factors of uh, seeing me as an in-group member and seeing you as an out-group member, what are the boundaries, what are, and within that region, for example, I mean, it can, it can go until um, religion, it can go until ethnicity, race, there are many factors playing a role in that aspect. Also sectarian issues, um, to what extent your confessional identity is one identity that drives you forward. So um, per personality psychology is looking into that by saying, um, by looking at the concept of people do have a multiple, la multiple layered identities, but what if, if one identity is in conflict with the other one? So what if you are a liberal democrat, but at the same time you define yourself as a Muslim, but then you've been caught up in a context drinking a nice uh, kavak ladera wine, so how is that gonna fit in, right? I mean, it may be that uh, you don't have an internal conflict, which is not causing internal conflict, but it's making then a conflict based on the perception of the others, because um, the way how how identity is formed is that people firstly socially categorize, which means you are categorizing yourself according to one um, confessional group, according the daughter of Ahmed Mehmet, I'm the or I'm the girlfriend of whatsoever, or I am I'm the I'm the ch I'm the chairman of a, a Lebanese or Turkish women's movement, and all that are are actually uh, making a huge component of the self-concept you develop. So um, it's not only the disincredity or like the the conflict that may cause within you, it's always uh, what, it, what about the beholder of the other, so how it's going to be perceived and what is the psychology, how, what is the narrative people are addressing to that. So um, as you can see, it's a, very, uh, it's a whole um, bunch of a lot of um, um, sub-disciplines of psychology coming, personality, social psychology, also experimental psychology, also the communication part, like how people, um, there are many, uh, for one example, there is one study where people are making a content analysis by looking at the speeches of political leaders. So according to that, you can see, and there's also one of a Bilkan professor looking at the speeches of Erdogan by seeing how often he uses the we how often he uses the us, the they, and how, how is that linked with adjectives, with proverbs. So you can, I mean, these are all correlative studies, which means there's a statistical relationship between if I use the, uh, the they with, for example, um, linked to the role of dignity, you can, I mean, this is a statistical correlation you can definitely come up with by making assumptions. But um, talking about empirical research, it will not give you the chance and not the right to make any causal um, um, assumptions, from, uh, any causal con conclusions from that. But um, I think it's a vast body of um, li literature and research people can apply in Turkey, or especially that region um, is, a, is a quite uh, interesting and uh, haven for social research at that level. So, um, they, what are the contributions of political psychology to the field of peace building and conflict resolution? I'm going slowly to the part of practical implementation here. So um, first, we're looking at the underlying factors, which means underlying means that people are not that aware of, of what drives your behavior, what drives your um, actions, what drives your thinking. And this is all the part that lies actually behind beliefs, motivations, how people perceive you, how, um, how informational processing is working in your brain. I mean, uh, we, are, we are always exposed to a, a huge and endless amount of information. So selective information is one thing. If I'm talking about racism, if I'm talking about AKP that much, or if I'm talking about JP that much, I was referring to that framework right now. You're gonna, you're gonna prime even if you don't want to. And this is something 
something actually social psychologists are using that much. Um, coming from the tradition of looking at white and um, uh, outgroup members of um, black Americans, African Americans, excuse me for that, so African Americans. So it means while priming somebody by giving them pictures for 10 seconds, uh, for 10 minutes, for example, showing Martin Luther King and showing, for example, charismatic political leaders of African-American descent and then showing another group uh, this, uh, a pattern of 10 minutes but with different pictures which means you show more um, Sudanese or Kenyanese um, politically active group but militias also Af of African-American descent um, you will you will at the end of the day you will have um, you're gonna let the people evaluate how they perceive these groups and you will see that um, through priming the people's minds, they're gonna uh, they're gonna show a higher probability to um, to show discriminative behavior uh, than you would show them than compared to uh, positions where they were exposed to the situations of neutral pictures. So it's all very subliminal and all very underlying, and this is making it so delicate. Um, I just would like to actually raise your awareness how to how to use narratives and how to use that um, psychology of communication in that part because um, words are making a lot of um, impact on that. So the thing is, um, right now I'm coming to the empire, so you're gonna uh, have an inside look in, in your own behavior and own thinking process. Um, was one thing where, psycho where political psychology got very um, actually active and uh, very known throughout the disciplines was looking at cognitive biases. Have you ever heard about that? Cognitive biases, anybody who may have an idea what biases are? Yeah, okay, I see smiles, good. So let us uh, all um, together learn what cognitive bias are, biases are all about. For example, there is one bias called hello effect. Uh, let me make an uh, experiment for that, what hello effect means. Uh, back in the US, they separate, they had participants uh, participating in um, experiments where they divided the group into one group and the other. And the one group was, um, the one group was exposed to, uh, let me do it the right way, exactly. The one group was exposed to the one video where they saw a French native speaking Belgian in interviewer with a slightly accent and the other group this group, for example, they were exposed to, uh, to the same speaker, but with a, um, um, how do you say, with a, where he was showing himself more in a disrespectful, cold, and in a very unprofessional way of how he was explaining himself by saying, by showing off, by saying, I love my research and I'm totally uh, involved with me, so more of the showing off. And to the other group, the same French-speaking Belgian um, instructor showed himself in a more respectful, more warm approach by showing, I, I am enthusiastic about research, I am enthusiastic by using flexible approaches. So at the end of the day, after this experiment, people were exposed to evaluate this person, the French-speaking Belgian instructor, um, through a um, different dimension of physical appearance, of uh, in, um, intelligence, and also of mannerism and the path of how they perceive him as competent or not. And believe it or not, this group who was exposed to the egocentric, disrespectful, cold instructor rated the person a different way than the one being exposed to the warm one. Almost 70% of that group was actually rating him as somebody who is on, the, uh, on a scale of one to seven, likely, extremely likely, and extremely dislikely. They, they report him as extremely dislikely, even, I mean, even if he was a good-looking guy. Like, that's the, I, this is very, um, excuse me, no, 70 per, oh, I mix it up the numbers, exactly, I, I mix it up the numbers. He's a, I mean, they scored him on a high level on physical appearance. So what happened was actually that they were, that they were perceiving him as somebody likely, extremely likely, even if he was disrespectful. This was this part, uh, disrespectful. Even if he was disrespectful, they were still 70% was voting for him as somebody who was extremely likely. So the hello effect is something you can actually conduct in any world, and you will see that people who have been perceived as physically attractive are uh, people are showing a more favorable um, way of evaluating him through saying, "Well, he's still a nice. I mean, I do like him still." This is an effect that is, even if you're aware of that phenomenon right now, and even if you understand the phenomenon, at the end of the day, if, even if you point it out to us, you will, you will end up, um, it will happen and you will end up upon it. So, hello effect, also known as the Hollywood effect. 
So if I ask you, give me the IQ of Bruce Willis or George Clooney, people will score him higher maybe than, um, I don't know, give me any ugly other actor. Exactly, <laughs> thank you, so on that. The weapon effect is something that is also very interesting. The weapon effect is something that um, in experiments people showed um, what happens um, in a laboratorily controlled setting, two groups, again, were exposed to, um, were exposed to either, okay, do this the other way around, either to aggressive um, cues, which means um, fire, firearms, revolvers, or to neutral uh, cues, to neutral cues, anything like a badminton racket or something. At the end of the day, when they were, ex where were going after it, they were going into a, um, another setting where they were exposed to show aggress aggressive behavior by giving uh, the other person of the end um, electrical shocks. And the group who were primed, that's what I'm saying, it's all about the mental representations. Uh, the group who were primed by having the exposure, visual exposure to the firearms and to the revolvers were showing a highly higher degree on showing aggressive behavior than the ones being exposed to badminton or rackets or chai or simit or whatsoever. I mean, I'm... And um, this, I mean, in countries where military and weapons are so overpresent, this effect is actually getting less. It's reduced because there's a higher level of um, of habits where people are used to weapons, see it all over. And um, so you can, this is something very important and it's the same for the words as well. One effect, one of my most favorite one is the system justification theory of used, um, Professor Used from the NYU is doing that. Um, I think this explains a lot and actually it's a fundamental theory to political behavior, so that's why it's been used that much. System justification theory um, is based um, again, across cultures, across continents, people do have the tendency of having an ego justification. Ego justification means whatever you do, even if you're not fine with it, and if it causes a, dis and if, if it causes a cognitive dissonance, you will find ways to justify your behavior. Because it feels not right and not very at ease to feel I'm doing not something that is not um, feeling somehow right, right? It's a stomach issue, it's coming from here. So system justification starts from ego justification. Then it's going to group justification. And then it's getting important because need to belonging to a group is something that is inherited to human beings. You can't help it. And um, whatever your in-group is, you will actually find your ways to justify their behaviors, to justify their positions. And this is something where it's getting about political parties. Whatever your leader may do, even if you like it or not, you're gonna find your ways to justify it. Because it feels not nice to be in the group of the, of, the, of the losers, right? I mean, so this is something everybody, I mean, exactly. And um, one thing where it's coming from, it's traditionally, for example, people who are from, they were looking at low and high socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's, I'm poor, but I'm happy, right? I mean, I'm poor, uh, ego justification, but the thing is, I'm happy, because I belong to the groups, I'm happy. Towards the group who are rich, but unhappy. Right, so this is where it's coming from, actually. It's been shown under white and African-American populations in studies. And then you have the other part coming where, from the part of the higher socioeconomic group, we're saying, well, I mean, we are rich, but we are honest. So this is the other part by coming rich and honest and going into, well, I mean, they're poor and dishonest. And just look into your own entourage and think about it. I think this is um, something where political psychology does give a, a, a high underlying contribution to what is happening out there, to the political arena, call it that way. So political psychology in the practice has many, many dimensions, and this is why actually there's not, there are too many layers in terms of your personality, in terms of how people uh, act upon in groups. So I feel it's, it's um, that's why the contribution, what we're doing in Lebanon, for example, is by getting people together and um, supporting, and this is the practical talking about, by supporting a knowledge-based dialogue process by calling it dialogue process and by calling it, by priming it towards these cognitive biases every human being is exposed to. And um, this is something where in group dynamics and decision making in groups are like the, 
the phenomenon of group thinking. I mean, you're gonna hold the harmony in the group. It doesn't feel right to have disharmony. So you're gonna you're gonna find your ways to just be uh, out of the efficiency to say, okay, let's leave it. Let's leave it this way of decision making and not do it hard way around. Maybe, but maybe sometimes some key national debates supposed to need common space where they come abroad and have their time to discuss in a more critical way. Because the way how the information processing works, you need a, a longer time. I mean, you, 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 you make your decisions in a pressured manner in a different way than if you have time, even if it's intuitive. So there's intuition coming into place. But um, so it's more about creating this awareness of that we need a common space for making decision making. And um, peace building, actually, where, it's, uh, where you have a psychology of polarization, a psychology of fragmentation, it's all about that, actually. Bringing people together and letting them talk while, very important, while uh, uh, um, raising up the awareness to those cognitive biases we are exposed to. And um, this is something I just would like to give everybody um, um, uh, on their way home to uh, maybe from the other or the, if they're in another group where they have to make any decision to think maybe twice or three times uh, rather than giving it the first one because this is it's maybe more crucial and have a, has a more crucial impact than you may assume so. So thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for your attention. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the, the weapon effect, and I'm curious if there's been any research um, in conflict-prone societies, because I, I work on Sudan a lot, and one of the, the, the things that people have been struggling with in, in South Sudan in particular um, is the, the proliferation or like the escalation and increasing violence of disputes between communities that were previously not violent, and there are a number of explanations that kind of, you know, talk about the impact of war, talk about the availability of small arms, but they all, there seems to be a missing link between, you know, how you take, uh, for instance, a recent conflict between communities over land and resources to a near genocidal level where you had youth militia, you know, vowing, you know, issuing statements about wiping out an entire ethnic group. And so I'm curious, um, you know, what the, the issue of the weapon effect might, and the research on that, you know, how that might apply to a situation like that. Very wonderful, especially from a person who's coming from the practice. Um, it's, uh, it's very valuable, actually. Thank you very much, Carly, right? Michelle, thank you very much. Um, the thing is, um, the weapon effect is only one, one of many effects. But um, in societies, actually, this is what, um, what uh, social psychology will tell you, in societies where the presence of uh, weapons and violence is on a daily basis occurring, the uh, people are getting more accustomed to the picture, so they do have a higher level of, of having violence as one part, or having conflict or one uh, fundamental part of their daily lives, then in societies where you have a lower level of violence, lower level of polarization, so this weapon effect, especially on that, is uh, in, in if you do it in Norway, for example, or give it me another country like Denmark, it's it's a, it's a, it will show a high, way higher significant um, score than in societies where of Sudan or of Iraq or Afghanistan. So it's maybe the other way of the. Um, and I, I wish I could have a more um, um, precise answer to that. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, even in Palestine, there's one research I just um, had on in, in a lecture on UNRWA, where they were looking at um, young people in, uh, living in the Palestinian refugee camps. For example, for them, if you ask them, what is, what is, your, what is your main, um, main um, with this satisfaction with your life? It's not the violence. And it's actually not the separation. It's actually the people are, the young people are getting worried about their own education by saying, I don't want to end up at somebody having not education and at my, in my 30s, not having a job, not being able to help my family. And so it's more, and this is something I, unfortunately people are, um, the human body and the human soul is so good in taking a lot of trauma, uh, a lot of traumas and dealing with it. And, Within the years, um, you're getting accustomed to it, used to it, rather than um, so it's getting more the, uh, the more subtle issues of importance. 
So um, unfortunately, I mean, there, but there are many. I mean, I can, I'm happy to give you also insights on that. But there are many initiatives doing nonviolent peacekeeping and peace building as well. A genocide is one thing. It's, it's not an interstate. It's an intrastate conflict. So you need people working within inside, not from the outside. This is one thing we do in Lebanon as well. And this is taking a long way, actually. There was one other question, Professor. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Sibel. Um, I'm sure Yashar Yakush and Özlem Kirtanoğlu would agree with me. Um, the Turkish politics is a tough environment. I was just wondering what's place for political psychology in Turkish politics. Do you think it would be a good way of improving a more sort of reconciliative uh, politics uh, in the Turkish environment? Do you think um, it could be used in a more effective way in Turkish politics? Thank you. Okay. To whom I address my answer, to this direction or to that direction? I don't know. Okay, this was smartly played, Professor Afasan. Okay, I appreciated that. Okay, Heidi. So, okay, um, as a political psychologist, I would say it's all change is happening, and this is something we did also for the Obama campaign. I volunteered back then in the US. It's starting on, this, on a very, very small level. It's starting with words, actually. So the words are making at the end of the day, they will become reality. So and I think the psychology of polarization in Turkey, what I see coming from the inter-level, inter-group to society level, it's uh, um, as somebody who's not in the in-group and looking at from the outside perspective, it's very um, sad and it's, and actually it's, um, and I think not only sad, I think it's, um, since it's, um, you're exposed to so many, like the change is so evident. Like if you look at the papers, there's not even, you can't say this is the headline today. There are more than 10 headlines, so what do you want to do? So every day it's um, like the, the change factor is that huge in that country um, that I feel um, we need more um, medeni, 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 civil, civilized way of a dialogue process, and this is something I can't see. I mean, the politicians fighting against each other were Turkish politicians. Um, and this is something I would like, I mean, this is something civilized and, and also, um, no, um, Turkey is a country having a huge identity crisis, I think. I mean, it's, it would be fine to look at it, that's why uh, so psychoanalysts looking at it. It has a trauma. Uh, which it looks like a patient to me has a trauma and not able to deal with it. Not deal with it in terms of um, the role of dignity, the role of pride. These are all concepts very important for the whole region. But don't forget that these concepts are all not primarily based internally, that they're primarily based externally. I mean, you can be, you can be perceived as somebody of big honor, of, of big pride. Prideful against whom? you need another perspective, right? So it's more, I feel the politics here is more based on a reactionary way than on an actionary based. And this is something uh, I feel like, come on, we can, we can play it smarter. We can play it smarter than just react. We can act. But for that, we need people who are giving the space to act. So uh, without being a political uh, scientist, this so far, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sybil. Thank you very much.